Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thanks, Brian. And today we're going to be reviewing the how, why, and when of Fostemsevere, also known as Rucobia. I have nothing to disclose. And what we're going to walk through today with the how, why, and when is first just to look at the mechanism of Fostemsevere, which has the abbreviation, I guess, now of FTR. We're going to compare that to the other antiretrovirals, just kind of see where that fits into the whole process. And then we'll dive a little bit deeper into the guts of the drug, if you will, and talk about some of the relevant pharmacokinetics, including some of the drug interactions and I think highlights or important principles that relate to clinical application of the drug. And then we'll spend a little bit of time just looking at one of the major clinical trials released a couple months ago in a New England Journal that led to the approval, so essentially why it got approved. And then finally, I think when to use this, and, and that's the, the take home point, is we'll look at some of the pluses and minuses of the drug and where we see it fitting. And just to start off looking at a patient that may fit in this realm of the drug is a 57 year old with 30 year history of HIV, neuropathy, lipodystrophy, chronic diarrhea, very typical of a possibly long standing treatment experienced individual with complete class resistance to both NRTIs and NNRTIs. He also had a trophile that came back as dual mix with a viral load of 50,000 C4 count of 150. You can see his drugs there that he's currently on. And then the question is, would Fostemsevir be an option for this individual? So let's start off looking at some of the kinetics and actions of the drug. I think we're all familiar with this slide and when we talk about most of the drugs that, that we use, we're kind of looking in this area of the replication cycle, where most of the time we're using an integrase inhibitor and a couple NRTIs, or possibly an NNRTI with a couple NRTIs. But what gets left out quite a bit in the conversation is the attachment, where the virus attaches to the CD4 cell. And we do have a couple drugs in this category, the fusion inhibitor and fervitide, as well as the CCR5 antagonist Maraviroc. But with this drug, it works a little bit differently. And so if we get a little bit sort of closer, if you will, to that where the virus binds to the CD4 cell, it's a, again, a unique and complex interaction where on the HIV cell is the GP120. So it's this protein and on it are the specific binding sites. And the CD4 cell has the receptor which connects to these causing a conformational change. And within this conformational change, CCR5 comes into play to then allow for the viral contents to come into the CD4 cell. Where this drug works and works differently, it does not work at the CCR5 receptor like Maraviroc. As you can see, the blue aspects here that represent the drug bind at the GP120 site. So this, is a, this drug is essentially a GP120 inhibitor. And the dr active drug Temsevere, which is the active component of the prodrug Fostemsevere, prevents this conformational change required for attachment, therefore preventing the deposit of the viral proteins in the CD4 cell. So simply by inhibiting this binding site, it will prevent the virus from attaching and progressing down that viral transmission pathway. To highlight some of the unique characteristics of the drugs, first of all, the absorption of the drug, its bioavailability is pretty stable. It can be taken with or without food, no, no restrictions or requirements, but it is needs to be taken twice a day as a BID drug. And Fostemsevere, as I mentioned, is a pro-drug. So once it's absorbed, it's then converted in the body to the active drug Temsevere. It's meta metabolic process or pathway is primarily twofold. One is simple hydrolysis and that's the, the majority. And the second is 
through the cytochrome P450 pathway. And that's important to remember when we do look at a few drug interactions, that although it can go through two pathways, and if you inhibit one, you can still get through another one. So the drug interactions are fairly minor. And on the flip side, it may inhibit OATP, uh, which can increase levels of other drugs that we'll see here shortly as well. And another nice caveat of the drug is in regards to excretion, it's, there are no adjustments that are needed in regards to impaired renal function or in dialysis. And just to highlight a few of the, I think, clinically relevant kinetic issues in regards to the interactions is that fostemsevere serum concentrations will drop and will drop significantly when given with a strong cytochrome P450 3A4 inducer, specifically carbamazepine, which we've talked about over the last few months with a few cases that carbamazepine sort of wreaks havoc with lots of other antiretrovirals, but rifampin as well, including St. John's wort, whereas rifabutin is not as strong and can be given along with it if needed. And the only significant interactions where fostemsevere increases concentrations are seen right now in a couple of the hep C meds, grisoprevir and voxelaprevir. And there are also some increases in ethanyl estradiol and as well as with statins. And that's all statins at least is how it's labeled now. I haven't been able to figure out exactly the major routes and, and the whys, but we do see increases that uh, we may need to adjust statin doses. And because this drug has been used in treatment experience patients, we've seen a lot of different antiretrovirals used. And a majority of the antiretrovirals are considered to be safe, including boosted protease inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, maraviroc, TDF. And then there are some other drug kinetic studies that have been done as well, as you can see there, that are considered to be safe. So shifting gears on the why the drug is now available and the major study that brought this to market was the BRIGHT study. And you can get this in its full content, if you will, out of the New England Journal from a couple months ago. And this study was, again, fairly unique, I found, in that one, it was a, it was a phase three randomized multi-center placebo control non-inferiority study as we see with a lot of our antiretrovirals and non-inferiority studies, looking at this in salvage therapy. And for patients to be eligible, they needed to be highly experienced, failing their current therapy, have a viral load greater than 400, multi-class resistance with at least one fully active drug in which you are unable to construct a viable regimen. And there were two cohorts, and we're going to focus on, on one cohort, which was the randomization cohort. Initially, patients were randomized either to their failing regimen or optimized background, along with severe or optimized background plus placebo. That was only done for eight days, and it was primarily done to look at this primary endpoint of reduction in viral load. They wanted to see how much viral reduction compared to placebo happened. And then patients were followed up at other endpoints at 24, 48, and 96 weeks. But there was a second cohort which was even more progressed in which there were zero active agents um, available. And looking at their baseline characteristics, I want to highlight a few things. The first is that their CD4 counts were extremely low. In the randomized group in which nearly 300 patients were randomized. Average CD4 counts were 99. And in that non-randomized group, which was even more progressed, where there were 100 patients randomized, we had an average CD4 count of 41. So very progressed. And then when you looked at the number of agents that were active, we had half of the patients in the randomized cohort with only one, where the other half had about two. But when you look at the non-randomized patients, these were the ones that have kind of burned all their matches, where they had zero active drugs in that optimized background regimen. Then when we look at the results, this was that first primary endpoint in the randomized cohort looking at day eight viral change, in which we saw almost a, a one log drop in those that had severe added, where there was a very negligible drop in placebo. And again, that was sort of expected, if you will. 
and then the meat and potatoes of the results in the brown line that was the randomized group that had one or two active drugs where the blue line was the non-randomized group looking at patients that had essentially zero active drugs and what they found was at roughly 48 weeks you had 60 percent of patients suppressing with fostemsevir in that randomized group whereas you only had about 50 percent but still i think a very strong response in those that had essentially zero active drugs when fostemsevir was added In looking at the adverse event profile, there were roughly a third to a half of patients admitting to having some sort of adverse event reported. The investigators attributed a lot of the adverse events not to the drug, but to how severely progressed patients were and to sort of uh, other infectious processes and diseases. And again, kind of as expected, the randomized group, which were a little bit higher CD4 count, more active drugs, there were fewer adverse events than in individuals with fewer active drugs. And what the investigators found is that only about 7% of patients discontinued because of the adverse events. And the major adverse events that patients complained about were either GI-related, nausea, diarrhea, or the main ones, or CNS effects, headache, fatigue, and sleep disturbances. And ultimately, what was brought out of the study is that the investigators concluded that in multidrug resistant and patients with limited options, those that received fostemsevir had significantly greater decrease in viral load than those receiving placebo in eight days, and efficacy was sustained out through 48 weeks. I don't have the 96-week data. Brian or somebody else might be able to speak to that, but I have not seen that as of yet. So... I guess bringing this all together, talking about its place in therapy, bringing this back to our patient who has essentially three-class resistance with NRTIs and NRTIs and is not eligible for Miraviroc, so possibly a PI and an integrase that would be active. If we, we know that some patients may suppress on those two drugs, but not everybody is able to. So looking at would Fostemsevir be an option in an individual like this? This may be where it has a role is in, in these you know, progressed individuals with, with limited options. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what the threshold is for adding or not adding in those cases. And I think the last point here, looking at kind of the tail of the tape, if you will, the pros. First of all, it's a completely new class, so no cross-resistance, no issues. It can be used in patients who are X4, so it's 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 just absolutely completely new class. And it has very manageable side effects and very few drug interactions. It's compatible with other ARVs, no food restrictions, safe in renal disease. And I don't know if this is a pro or not, but I was able to get pricing, but we at least know the cost. It's right around uh, $9,000 for a one month supply. Kind of on the con side, it is a twice daily dosing regimen and There is some data suggesting that with hepatic impairment, we may see an increase in Fostem severe. And we don't know a whole lot about the unknown or about resistance. And in some, in the clinical trials, there were patients who failed that did develop some resistance. So I think that is still being teased out a little bit. So bringing it home, we have a new drug that blocks the attachment of the virus at the GP120, works regardless of R5X4 status, twice daily with food, few interactions, safe renally, all the way into hemodialysis. Looking at saving it for our heavily treatment experienced patients, and we still have some unknowns. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Brian. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.